Can somebody check if our streams there? You're live? Perfect. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, are you, what do you prefer? Do you want to get the questions at the end or can we interrupt so, you? Yes, I think 45 minutes would be too long without questions. So I think whenever there's a question, feel free to interrupt. Okay. I will try to pace it accordingly. Okay. That sounds great. So it's already 30. Uh, let me introduce you very briefly. Thank you. So uh, welcome to this uh, live seminar, Supper Live Seminar, uh, folks on YouTube and uh, also in the room and also in the Zoom meeting. Uh, so in this uh, live seminar, uh, we host uh, Anish Saxena from Georgia Tech. Uh, he's working with uh, Professor Moinitin Kureshi. And uh, it's one of the top uh, places actually in the US that you want to do research in. Um, and uh, his interest lies in computer architecture, hardware security, and data center systems in general. So he is focusing on, I assume, all like reliability, security, and scale out yes. everything regarding that. And uh, he's working on both like side channel attacks and raw hammer kind of uh, problems that today's system face and that gets worse uh, as we go forward. And uh, he is also doing uh, research related to CXL, uh, which is an upcoming fascinating thing for uh, scaling up or scaling out our DRAM capacity. And he has collaboration with like many top companies like Intel Labs, Micron, NVIDIA, AMD Research. And uh, he graduated from IIT Kanpur in 21 and he's a Aditya Birla Group scholar. Okay, so uh, today we will talk about secure and scalable raw hammer defenses. Uh, uh, this is a topic that we are all very interested in and we are uh, excited to hear about your uh, two papers, right? Absolutely. Uh, one of them is published last year in Micro, if I remember, and the other one is going to be uh, presented this week in DSN. Absolutely, and you get Perfect. Like a <laughs> view onto that. Thank you so much for the yeah. kind introduction. And thanks, guys, for joining today. So I'm Anish, and I think we can get started on today's talk, which will be on secure and scalable Rohammer defenses. So You can click once uh, the pointers in the click. Oh, I see. Yeah. All right. So let's start with the outline of the talk. And I'll try to pace it uh, such that I take questions uh, along the way, not at the end uh, necessarily. So first we'll talk about the threat of Rohammer and how it is getting worse. Then we will look at uh, how Ro how defenses against Rohammer are typically designed. And first we'll focus on the tracking aspect of Rohammer and I'll talk a little bit about why we need to track anything. And in this, I'll first cover the commercially deployed defensive and then their limitations, then what has academia co come up with and what are the proposed defenses. And then we will talk about the mitigative action, which is the second part of Rohammer or the other aspects of Rohammer defenses. And We'll look at different mitigative actions such as victim refresh, which I'll talk about how, uh, what are the shortcomings of victim refresh and what can we do about it. And next we'll look at, well, if we, because Rohammer is worsening and maybe it is hard to detect or understand all failure modes, all fault modes, all uh, the complete vulnerability model of future DRAM modules right now, then maybe we can look at strong detection capabilities instead of eliminating the threat altogether. So trading off some capability of data corruption with strong data detection. So I'll present a case for that. And then finally, we'll look ahead and see what we can do or what we can expect in terms of low hammer research, in terms of defense specifically in the future as thresholds decrease. And then uh, in the face of new memory interconnect technologies like CXL, which I briefly touch upon. So let's get started. 
So as a primer, and I think uh, Safari is like a great venue to talk about Rohammer. So I will not waste a lot of time, but I'll quickly cover the basics. So Rohammer occurs when an aggressor row is frequently accessed so that it causes bit flips in nearby so-called victim rows, right? The attack requires activating the same row frequently, which can be done by only a few instructions necessarily in assembly, which I've shown here. And this small loop has become a severe security threat. So it has resulted in not only data corruption attacks, which we can expect because you are essentially accessing uh, bits in memory without accessing them via software mechanisms. So it has resulted in not only data corruption attacks, but also confidentiality breaches where I can read what the data is in my nearby rows, which belong, which may belong to a different process and also privilege escalation attacks, where as a user level process, I can cross the privilege boundaries and do kernel level stuff. So it's a serious security threat and it is only getting worse. So let's look a little bit about how Rohammer manifests itself. What are the characteristics of Rohammer? The first thing I'd like to point out is the access pattern. What we saw previously was essentially one row being hammered and the rows nearby getting um, inducing bit, uh, incurring bit clips, right? So that is something we can call a one location hammer, which would be possible easily in closed page policies. But what about, let's say you have open page policies so the row does not close itself. In that case, you can do a different access pattern. Let's say a double-sided row hammer where you alternatively access to rows in memory to ensure that um, the rows get closed and are actually activated, not just accessed in DRAM, right? And then there are all sorts of complex attack patterns that people have come up with. These is, this is only a small subset. And these are by no means the uh, most complex patterns that, that we have seen in the recent literature. The second aspect, which I think uh, graphs the headlines in Rohammer is the threshold of activations that you need to do to any row in memory, the minimum number of activations that you need to do to incur a bit flip in any row. So that is called the Rohammer threshold. And I think uh, this group, uh, Safari group has done a lot of work in characterizing memory to understand the characteristics of this threshold, its dependence on different uh, parameters like temperature and so on. So in general, the threshold has been decreasing and fast. So in 2014, you had to do 140,000 activations and today only a few thousand activations, perhaps 5,000 5, are enough for some of the most vulnerable DRAM models. So this threshold has increased, decreased by, thank you, by 30x over the past eight years. 5,000 activations does not take a lot of time considering each activation takes of the order of tens of uh, nanoseconds, 50 nanoseconds, let's say. The next thing is the blast radius. Essentially, as DRAM technology is getting denser because we are moving towards smaller and smaller nodes, more bit cells are getting packed together in the same unit area. And the amount of interference between these DRAM bit cells has been increasing. And this increases the impact radius or the blast radius of the vulnerability when you activate a row frequently, the aggressor frequently. So the defenses that we designed as architects must work not only at current, current DRAM thresholds or current Rohammer thresholds, but also for future uh, modules, which will have not just worse thresholds, but also different characteristics in terms of blast radius and other, other uh, defining parameters of Roham. So what can we do about it? So let's first look at how does typical Rohammer protection work and uh, then take it from there. So essentially, typical Rohammer solutions consist of two parts. You first have to track the accesses to frequently activated rows and then perform a mitigative action when the number of accesses to this so-called aggressor row reaches the threshold or reaches near the threshold to ensure that it does not cross the threshold. The mitigative action is to typically refresh the content of the victim rows, which is itself an activation. And uh, this is a commercially deployed solution. You can find it in DDR4 modules, essentially track and then mitigate by refreshing victims. Now, this is called target row refresh in, uh, in contemporary modules, and it is a deployed defense. 
so how does it work right so the problem is the trr algorithm was a black box until someone re reverse engineered it but it was a black box and dram vendors were like we got this you don't have to worry about this um rohammer is not a problem anymore right so what what you do is from a sequence of ac uh, accesses or activations um somehow the algorithm tracks the most frequently used and performs a mitigative action the problem is it was broken and it was broken a few years ago by uh, trespass and blacksmith attacks where where they essentially found out that instead of um uh, a given instead of typical access patterns if you activate a lot of different rows in memory uh, within a short duration of time the tracker state is not big enough to contain information about the number of activations for all these rows and it overflows so they miss or the aggressor ex escapes detection and it is not mitigated which leads to bit flips even in presence of this commercially deployed mitigation so that did not work and security by obscurity is really a, a solution so in general we need to de devise principle defenses that can track all aggressor rows irrespective of the access pattern right at a given rohammer threshold so how do we do that there are different flavors of so let's first look at how do we track all the rows in memory because that was the thing that was broken by trespass um there are different flavors of rohammer trackers the first one that we will briefly discuss are probabilistic trackers um so essentially what they do is on every activation to the row you refresh its victims or perform the mitigative action with a very small pro probability and you figure out the probability by analyzing the rohammer threshold and the access pattern and the blast radius such that the chance of an attack or the chance of bit flips is negligible right like very very low uh, close to the dram reliability uh, in absence of rohammer so typically as a rule of thumb you can say that the threshold is about 1 over 50 of the rohammer Uh, sorry the probability of launching a mitigation is 1 over 50 of the rohammer threshold which works well um if your threshold is 50000 your your activation probability is 0.1% which has negligible performance overheads and protects against rohammer irrespective of the access pattern assuming you know the threshold and the blast radius right the problem is um if the thresh now that the thresholds are in the sub 10000 regime and likely to go get worse as dram uh, reliability worsens the act, the probability increases linearly at a given threshold for uh, for increases in threshold so you will need to do a lot of activations even if your program or your system is not really going and uh, going through a rohammer attack so you are essentially wasting performance without uh, without the threat of a rohammer of rohammer attacks right or even rohammer vulnerability um so it doesn't scale uh, gracefully to low thresholds is the main problem with probabilistic trackers the second tracker would be the design that you might come up with or you might think about first time you learn about this vulnerability which is well i have rows i know how many rows i have let me just put a per row dram per row counter to just count the number of activations to each row right and i will reset this counter every 64 millisecond which is the dram refresh period so the problem here is you will have millions of rows in memory your typical row size is 8 kilobytes if you have 64 gigabyte of memory you will have 8 million rows and if you allocate one or two bytes per counter depending on what your threshold is then you are looking at 8 to 16 megabytes of tracker state the question is first question is the first thing is that's a lot for Uh, sram based tracking so you can't just put the whole tracker in sram typically but if you put it in dram then how do you access it and then the metadata access overheads come into play so this is the main issue with per row tracking the third is hot row trackers well let me be a bit more intelligent about this i don't need to actually track all the rows i can't i can't hammer all the rows in memory because i just don't have the time budget to do it so what if i only activate um or only track a subset of the rows which are likely or which will be aggressor rows aggressor rows and then i don't miss any if i don't miss anything then everything is good and i am able to track all the aggressors in memory 
So this is, these are more intelligent algorithms and there has been a lot of research recently in this domain also. So essentially these track, tracking mechanisms are an active area of research as to how do I design mechanisms for current and future thresholds. Now, the challenge here, the challenge for designing these, thresh, uh, these trackers for ultra low thresholds is there are a few parameters. One is how many activations can I do within 64 millisecond refresh period? That's about 1.3, 1.4 million kilowatts. Uh, and then the second, uh, second parameter is obviously the threshold itself. So if my threshold is 1000, I can do 1.4 million activations overall. Then I can at most hammer 1.4 million over 1000 goes, right? That's quick math. And that is per bank because you can access banks in parallel. So then the maximum number of aggressors for a row hammer threshold observed in DDR3, which is around 100K, is only about 500 rows for 32 banks, which is pretty manageable. Like if you have a, a, an intelligent tracking algorithm, you only need a few hundred entries, maybe a thousand entries, and you are able to track all aggressors in them. The problem is the threshold is not 100K for contemporary DRAM modules and certainly not for future DRAM modules, or maybe not for future DRAM modules. Then the, no the number of rows that need to be tracked increases inversely with the threshold at a threshold of 1000, which is not that far off from 5000, which we have already seen. Uh, you will need to track 45,000 rows in memory and just um, just a quick note that DDR5 has 32 banks compared to DDR4, which had say, eight or 16. So the number of banks have doubled in DDR5. So if your tracker is per bank, then the tracker state just doubled even at the same capacity as DDR4. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I just like, can you track regions? Regions of memory? So that's a good question. So question is, if I track, let's say at a, at a larger granularity, what would happen, yeah. right? The problem is um, Rohammer, Rohammer manifests itself at a row granularity, which is eight kilobytes. So if you track, let's say a one MB region and you find out that it, there is an aggressor in that region, how do, you, how do you know which row is the aggressor? Because that's just eight kilobyte or few eight kilobyte regions out of a one megabyte region. And then the second question is, even if I know, this region is an aggressor, what do I do about it? What is the mitigative action here, right? I was thinking if, if you could, let's say, detect the region, you yes. could also apply I think, any sort of different metadata that you could, one of them to refresh. Well, that's. Um, you can that, refresh that, that region, for instance. So that is a possibility, although at low thresholds, the problem would be regions might become hot because of one or two rows, and then you will be refreshing the whole region, which is, let's say, hundreds of rows, incurring hundreds of unnecessary victim refreshes, causing performance overhead. So I guess one of the aspects that I did not cover yet is the performance overhead of these mechanisms. If, if your rows, if only 500 rows in 64 milliseconds incur, you know, an extra refresh, it's not that big of a deal. 64 millisecond is hundreds of millions of cycles. Right. But if tens of thousands of rows incur this mitigative action, then you really need to be precise because if you exceed or perform much more mitigations than required, then you are essentially dealing with severe performance loss. Right. Uh, Kira, you had a question. Uh, yes. So uh, I, I see how when you increase the number of banks, you can uh, perform many row hammer attacks in parallel uh, to different rows. Uh, but uh, so this is more like an ideal case, right? So absolutely. Uh, so because of the power concerns and uh, some uh, delays in the cir IO circuitry, uh, we need to uh, put some like other timing constraints between activations going to different banks. And when we consider like T4 kind of parameters, for example, TRR, DTR, DLS, like those parameters. How does it change these numbers for like two or two banks? So what would essentially change is the maximum number of activations that you can do. Yeah. Instead of 1.4 million, if we go down to 1 million, then you can reduce it by the same percentage for yes. 32 banks. So yes, it will not exactly be 45K. This is more of a rough estimate, but you can safely say it will be tens of thousands. But I agree, mm -hmm. there are definitely nuances here, which I'm just hiding. 
Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, it's like doomsday scenario <laughs> in a sense, but I, I, I understand like the uh, more realistic values are also closer to these numbers. I agree. So, so what what I'm trying to get here, get at here, is the scale, right? Going from a few hundred rows to a few tens of thousands, it's like yes. orders of magnitude higher. So the tracker state is also orders of magnitude larger. But I, it's not exactly 45 cases. So because also some time is taken during DRAM refresh, so you have to subtract that for portion. I just divided 1.4 million by whatever the threshold. Mm -hmm. so, um, right, let's, let's continue. So what are the, what was that? Right. So now that the tracker state is very large, what are the current solutions or recent solutions that people have come up with? So I would say the most, efficient solutions in terms of number of entries um, is the is graphene, which relies on an algorithm called Mistra Grease. Essentially, given a stream of data, it tries to figure out the most, uh, the top n most, re uh, most frequently accessed values out of those, out of that stream, which happens to be what we want to do for row hammer tracking as well. So they implemented it in hardware, turns out it requires sort of a fully associative search so you require content addressable memory, which is a different kind of memory technology compared to s -Rack. And if you do have that, it works. And you are able to, uh, you're able to track all aggressors row, aggressor rows uh, with the number of entries, which is roughly twice of um, maximum aggressors that I just showed on the last side. So let's say the maximum aggressor is 45K, you need about 90K entries in your tracker. So that, and, and that's close to what I would say is the most efficient algorithm. And at a threshold of 35 uh, kilo, uh, 35, 000, uh, sorry, 32,000, graphene only has an, uh, an average or only has an SRAM overhead of about five kilobytes, which is pretty negligible considering multi, multi megabyte caches in your chip. So uh, this is a memory controller level solution. Now, second is, a bloom filter type solution. So this is taken from, from Blockhammer, which is work. And essentially bloom filter is also a space efficient implementation of finding whether an element exists in a set or not. And the way they implemented it, it's pretty efficient. It's not quite as efficient as graphene, but it does not require CAM. So it requires only SRAM, which is um, more widely used technology and with about 50 kilobytes of SRAM. You can you can track all like lesser rows with very low false positive rates. Although, uh, and then if you just compare it for the sake of comparison to per row counters, that requires multi So it just doesn't scale. But if you look at very uh, very low thresholds, ultra low thresholds, let's say 10x lower than what we have currently seen, the amount of SRAM or CAM required by these solutions explodes, and it, it becomes prohibitively large. I I don't think people would be happy dedicating a megabyte or so of SRAM to track Rohan, right? And interestingly, the per row counter, the state of the per row counters decreases because the counters are now smaller. You still have to track per row, but just the counters are smaller, so it decreases in size. So these SRAM based trackers incur prohibitive overheads. That is the problem. Uh, one yes. Question. So the things uh, over the increases with reducing the threshold. Yeah. Uh, per row reduces them. Yes. But if you have more DRAM, probably per row. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. This is for ISO capacity. Per row decreases because let's say at 32k, each uh, counter would be would need to store up to 16,000. Let's say right. So that would be 16 bits or two bytes. At 250, you only need to store up to 128, which is just seven bits. So it decreases per row, per row, but the number of counters are the same. So what what about if I have a channel like uh, a system with like 16 channels, I have oh, yeah. rows track, but graphene still has around the same way. Because I think it's already an increase with only reducing all hammer threshold, not the number of rows. So uh, no, so graphene's overhead is per bank. So if you have 16 channels, your number of banks would also be 16x. So this multiply this number by 16x, multiply, I would say all of these numbers by 16x, right? So, so right, for the largest systems, you would require tens of megabytes of cache, which uh, 
unfortunately security is a trade off between performance area and security it's hard to justify okay let's move on what if you just put let what if you had per row counters and because 8 megabytes of sram is quite a lot just put it in dram 8 megabytes of dram is practically nothing right but the problem becomes access overhead if you access every time if you perform a metadata access for these counters every time you access the row in memory then you are just going to have 2x memory memory pressure for for row hammer tracking so what what do you do well you can just put a cache which caches the counters wherever you want to reduce the average memory access time put a cache and cache your frequently used counters and only on a miss now you will uh, now will you need to access the row count table so that seems to work uh, and this was proposed by earlier solutions like CRA counter row activation uh, back in back when row hammer was disclosed in 2014. But the problem is that ultra low thresholds, which we just see, which we have just seen, the performance overhead is quite drastic. So these are workloads uh, from a variety of benchmark spec, gap, uh, parsec, and so on, and normalized performance compared to an unproductive baseline. You see that the average slowdown of uh, CRA like approaches, essentially the tracker that I've shown on top is about 20 to 25%, which is a lot like currently because Moore's law is slowing, that's basically one or two generations. Um, so that doesn't work. So what can we do, right? Like SRAM tracking has prohibitive SRAM overhead, DRAM tracking has prohibitive performance overhead. What, what gives? So let's, yes. Sorry, I was going to ask if these results are from Hydra and you, you just show Hydra in the next yes, slide. So, yes, these are from Hydra's paper, motivation for Hydra. Okay. Um, I'll quickly cover Hydra. Um, so Hydra is a hybrid tracker. So question was, what do you do, right? SRAM has prohibitive SRAM overhead. DRAM based tracker is prohibitive performance overhead. Let's try to combine them to produce a hybrid tracker. The key insight here is you can hammer a few rows a lot of times, or you can hammer a lot of rows a few times right but you cannot hammer a lot of rows a lot of time because you only have that uh, you only have a given budget of activations right you can't have many many aggressors and many rows that are aggressors so the key insight in hydra hydra is we do track all rows in dram at ultra low threshold because the number of rows that can become aggressors are very high but in fact the number of rows that become aggressors in typical workloads is not very high because the, uh, the number of rows that incur hundreds of activations is still quite low, but a lot of rows incur tens or few tens of activations. So what do you do? You just filter out those activated but not frequently activated rows using an SRAM based filter. So let's let's go back to our baseline design where you have a row per row counter, you have a cache of counters. The problem is this cache would be thrashed because you are accessing it a lot because a lot of rows incur activations. Just put a filter in front of it, right? Put a group based filter. So essentially you track a group of rows and maintain a counter at a, at a per group basis. So it's not an exact count, but it will give you a conservative worst case estimate of what the activations to that row might be. And only if the group count exceeds the group threshold, do you maintain a per row counter and go to fine grain per row tracking. So it still tracks and still is able to uh, determine all the aggressors. But in the common case, if most of the rows only incur a few activations, they will just buy, they will just bypass the row counter cache because the group counter table will tell them, oh, you are fine. You, you are not even close to the threshold yet. Right. So this is Hydra. This was recently uh, discussed at ISCA last year. And let's see how it works very quickly. Let's assume a Hydra, a row hammer threshold of 500. So a Hydra threshold of 250 because there is a reset of the tracker state due to um, Due to the mismatch between DRAM, because we don't know when the DRAM refresh to a particular row happens. So we have to conservatively assume some worst case access pattern and the threshold is half. So for a row hammer threshold of 500, the Hydra's, th Hydra's threshold and pretty much any other stateful tracker's threshold would be 250. The group threshold, until which you don't even need to consult the per row counters, is 200. So an access comes to um, to all accesses go to the group count table if the if the value of the per row uh, of the group count is less than 200 then that's okay just let the access go and uh, 
increment the counter group counter if it is not less than 200 then you consult the precise per row tracking and um you, you first consult the cache if it misses in the if it if you find the counter in the cache great you still don't have to do a metadata dram access if not go to that per row counter table right so how does it help well 90 percent of the accesses only go uh, only need to consult the group counter table nine percent of the accesses remaining accesses of all the accesses nine percent of the accesses need to consult the row count cache uh, per row counter cache and then less than one percent of the accesses go to the group count uh or to the to the dram to met to access metadata right so even at a threshold of 500 which is about 10x lower than what we have currently seen recently seen um the number of metadata accesses is practically determined performance is very low and then, then you see the size of these structures it's in tens of kilobytes of sram and this is for a whole channel of memory or a rank of memory not necessarily a bank right because the overheads of Hydra depend on the intensity of accesses by the workload, not by the Ruama threshold per se. Another question? Oh, sorry. Right? So that works. I mean, how does Hydra perform? Uh, let's look at a system with two ranks, eight kilobyte buffers. Um, well, most of the uh, most of these bars are like close to one. The normalized performance is like the normalized slowdown is like less than 1% and the SRAM overhead is about 50 kilobytes for 32 GB of memory. So we have reduced that by orders of magnitude, right? All right. So uh, I have this is a corner case. Uh, yes. Let's say uh, an adversarial uh, user knows that Hydra is implemented and uh, this uh, attacker uh, has information about the eviction policy or like whatever professors in commands in the system, um, can they exploit these cache misses of this uh, cache in the memory controller, the row count cache, so that uh, it will exacerbate the off-chip data communication uh, with the DRAM? Absolutely, yeah. So did you look at this corner case? In an adversarial scenario, certainly you can essentially double the number of accesses because this is essentially a cache, right? And we know how to thrash caches now. So it will be thrashed and you will need to do metadata accesses. It does not uh, change the security guarantees of Hydra. Uh, you will have a worst case performance overhead of 2x accesses compared to the baseline, which, which is bad. But if you look at typical row buffer hit trace for, for workloads which have open, for open page policies, then it is similar to having like a row conflict instead of a row buffer hit in terms of the slowdown that you would get. All right, so let's move on. Let's look at mitigative actions and what is, is there a problem with mitigative actions? We have been considering all throughout that you can refresh the victims. That is the, that is the solution, right? Or is it? So let's, let's look at the pitfalls of victim refresh. There was this very nice work from Google uh, called Half Double, which was recently uh, unveiled and it was presented as security, uh, used next security last year. So, turns out at very low thresholds, if you do a lot of hammers to the aggressor, let's say a million access to the, to the aggressor, you will launch so many victim refreshes that the access, that the activations due to the victim refresh itself causes bit flips at, on rows which are a distance of two away. And they showed some correlation between um, the near aggressor, so to speak, uh, so to speak, um, which is here labeled the victim, and the far aggressor, which is the aggressor row. So essentially, you need both these access. It's not just uh, not just you did, um, you know, so many victim refreshes and then you get bit flips, which are essentially activations. So you need to do both far aggress far activations and near activations. What did what it essentially sheds light on is the fact that you are seeing more tighter coupling or interference in, in your bit, uh, bit cells and DRAM rows such that non-adjacent rows also get impacted. So half double breaks not only your commercial defenses, but all defenses that would rely on victim refresh as their mitigations, which was something that people thought is okay, right? Like you can do that. So that's a, yes, go ahead. So why does not refreshing uh, distance of two rows 
fix the problem. So it would fix the problem if you count the, the, the refreshes themselves as activations, right? And if you can do that, then yes, assuming that you know what the blast radius is. So let's say at a future, you, you design a system for current DRAM modules, five years down the line, if your DRAM modules so just so happen to have rows where your blast radius is three rows instead of two, your threat model might break. So that, that is the key problem. It is not necessarily that two rows are impacted or you need to refresh two rows instead of one. Question is you need to refresh more than one. So it is correlated and it might get worse. Mm -hmm. Right? Be because I, I, I think we know that one manufacturer is refreshes but two Correct. neighboring rows. Correct. They are aware of this issue. Also. So so I agree, right? Like DRAM vendors would know exactly what is happening with their devices and they, they would have the capability of uh, deploying defenses, which is exactly what is required. So nothing more, nothing less. Problem is they never disclose what they do. Like um, at least in terms of white papers or more technical reports. And essentially we don't need, we shouldn't want to wait for an attacker to figure out for researchers to figure out, oh, you can actually break the defense that is currently deployed, let's say in DDR5. You should, de you should design defenses from ground up, which are provably secure, right? So that is the pitfall of victim refresh. What can you do about it? So a very nice work from HPCA, uh, again, Giray's work, Blockhammer, uh, approaches it from a different angle. So essentially, instead of focusing on the victim, what if you focus on the aggressor? The aggressor is causing trouble, right? So let's try to let's try to mitigate by focusing on the aggressor. What if you control the rate of accesses to the aggressor such that there is no chance that they will be able to do more than the threshold number of access, accesses within 64 milliseconds? And then you have some performance uh, bounds, on, not some performance, well, you have some performance bounds, but then you also have security guarantees that I will just not allow more than the threshold number of accesses. And, and I will disallow it in a way such that it does not hamper the uh, common case performance of the workloads. So this is Blockhammer and it works. The, the, the key issue here would be that at a threshold of 32,000, the worst case um, delay that you would need to incur on rows would be of the order of few microseconds. And this is only incurred on a few rows because again, uh, only a few rows ever reach hundreds of active or thousands of active, tens of thousands of activations that would be required to cause this worst case. Delay. So that works, right? Unfortunately, as you decrease the threshold, the worst case delay increases inversely and the number of rows that incur this worst case delay increase even more, com uh, even more compared to the increase in the worst case delay because many, many more rows incur tens or hundreds of activations compared to thousands or tens of thousands of activations. And the delay you could assume is roughly the product of these two in terms of what kind of performance overhead you can expect. So the performance overhead really increase drastically when you go to ultra low thresholds or very low thresholds. So what can we do about that? Well, the idea is good that we should focus on the aggressors, right? So another line of work is to essentially, instead of um, blocking accesses to the aggressor, just break the spatial correlation between the aggressors and victims. As long as the aggressor is within the vicinity of the victims, victim rows, there is a possibility that they will be able to um, co craft complex attack patterns to incur bit flips. But what if you just move the aggressor uh, or swap the aggressor row with a randomly selected row in memory? And you can do all of this at the memory controller. In that case, essentially the aggressor is in a completely new neighborhood. And if it continues to cause activations, you can, or continues to hammer itself, the attacker continues to hammer itself, then you can just move it with, or swap it with another randomly selected row in memory. And when I say row, I mean a physical row, Aggressors or attackers have access to virtual memory, uh, which get translated to physical addresses. But this is the actual addresses, uh, DRAM, uh, DRAM rows in memory, right? So you can do that at the memory controller while being transparent to the OS, transparent to the software. So this was the random, this is the randomized row swap defense, which was presented at ASCLOS last year. And you need like an in-direction table because now you need to consult 
essentially if your row has been swapped or not do you do i need to go to the original location x or to some other location y for my to get the data right and it rrs breaks the spatial proximity by swapping the aggressor and the randomly selected victim so it works the problem here is it requires on security by randomization and to to do it securely to to minimize the probability of um this the attacker just uh to minimize the probability that the attacker randomly stumbles upon this uh randomly swapped row to minimize this probability you need to swap at a much greater rate than the threshold how much greater if your threshold is trh then you then you need to swap essentially six times as fast to minimize this probability due to an attack pattern called the uh birthday paradox attack so at a threshold of 4000 good i'm fine with that how how swapping can really be a long term solution so that's a good yeah good because i mean you swap in money whatever you put in unless you have some sort of isolation in memory this let's say some secure vault that are so resilient to the uh, program you can be secure because otherwise you keep swapping in just for the region that maybe also like normal road and you keep basically by the same thing and if that i could keep running the same position all the time so so the question is there are two aspects um one is how does the attacker know what is the newly mapped address of row f newly mapped address x for the same physical row that was the aggressor right if you look at the diagram aggressor is essentially this row in between the two victims now if the attacker needs to keep attacking this row it needs to find row x row address x it does not have access to the information and there are some attack patterns which which help you find that but the but the key point is it is not easy to find so you will have time but i agree with your first point which is you will need to keep swapping and since the swapping rate is so high at low thresholds it will just not scale so i agree with you i mean like if if your goal is to somehow leak uh some information because you need a proper location of a row then the mechanism may work but if you just want to make the system break you really don't know you don't need to know about the row you just need to keep coming it i see i see whatever information you have and if you think in a large scale let's say you know is a large region of memory that have let's say sensitive data you really don't care which row is there as, as far as you know the range of which these rows have been spotted doesn't matter for you because you keep running and so so by breaking the system do you mean the performance of the system or the security of the system i think both so you can break the performance or well you can have a lot of performance over is it over it in the worst case as is the case with most team is schemes in terms of security even if i know the physical addresses to a region of rows that i want to hammer if i keep hammering them they will keep moving around in memory right yeah. you will not be able to hammer or cause any bit flips as such you will have a performance implication but it won't necessarily degrade the security yeah. but that being said i have not put it in the slides but there is a recent attack called juggernaut which was uh which was showcased in the best paper at hpca this year scalable row swap which essentially crafts an attack pattern where you can you can indeed cause bit flips even in presence of randomized row swap practic uh, essentially because this security relies on randomization and you need to do it in a principled way otherwise if you miss some corner cases you will uh, you will incur bit flips okay perfect correct there is some uh... Could you just divide, let's say, your random account by nearby rows? So let's say I think there is some, like, if I'm correct, there's some test that shows that if, let's say, if your if your threshold is like 5k activation, so you can do 2.5 by the top row, 2.5 by the top row, and you can split the one in the middle. That's correct. That's the double double sided row. So and for this case, you won't you account for that. Account. So, yeah. so you account for that. You assume that the threshold is two point five k, not five k in that case, for for these differences, right? So, so I think the point was kind of covered here that you need to swap at a very fast pace, which might work at high thresholds, but at low thresholds that we will see in the near future, the rate is just so so high, or the number of activations required to swap is just so low that you will keep on swapping. Not only that, the performance overhead is very high. 
obviously. At 1000, it's about 20% for the secure mitigation. The problem is even the SRAM overhead exceeds megabytes just for the row indirection table that we uh, briefly discussed last in the last slide. So it re it's really not scalable to low thresholds. So what do we do for ultra low thresholds? Well, the first point that you made uh, was we need some sort of isolation, right? So here is one of the solution um, I presented last year at Micro. This is Aqua, where you essentially quarantine aggressors instead of randomly swapping them with memory, right? So use isolation instead of randomization. That is the key insight, right? You have a quarantine region in memory, which is a bunch of physical rows. Doesn't have to be actually physically contiguous in your DRAM memory, DRAM devices, but it is earmarked as a, as, as a range of physical addresses where essentially if you, if you need to perform a mitigation, you put the row in this region, which is inaccessible by software. So essentially no row maps to this. You lose some DRAM capacity, but what you do get is whenever the aggressor now let's say keeps on hammering the row, you can just keep on uh, putting it in different rows within this quarantine region with the guarantee that given enough size for this region, you will never run out of rows within 64 milliseconds to put this attacker in a new row in the quarantine region. So given enough capacity, the, uh, the row will never, no row in the memory will incur enough activations to cause row hammer, right? Right. So that is the security guarantee, which is similar to what you would expect from row hammer defenses. No row in memory can, should incur more activations than the threshold, right? So the question is, okay, I missed a slide here, which was about how do you size the quarantine region, but I will give a very brief overview. Essentially, we did some analysis and found that it does not scale inversely with the threshold. In fact, even at an impractical threshold of few tens, you only need to reserve about 2% of your memory capacity in the worst case um, to protect against low hammer. And for current thresholds of about 1000 or threshold at which it was evaluated of about 1000, you only need to reserve about 1% of your DRAM to protect uh, for, for the quarantine. So, so the major performance overhead for these row migration schemes is moving the rows, right? The row migration itself. And compared to RRS, Aqua performs much less row migrations. And then the question would be why? Well, the first is it does not need to artificially reduce the threshold. RRS, as you recall, swaps at a rate which is 6x lower than the threshold or higher than the threshold. Aqua does not need to. It only uh, swaps at a rate which is 2x of the threshold due to the tracker. If the tracker is perfect and somehow works at the Ruhammer threshold, Aqua can work at the Ruhammer threshold as well. Right? Secondly, the, no the number of rows that incur, you know, that 3x higher threshold are also very low. Right? Um, so you just have less mitigations and less performance over it. The third aspect is and this is a constant, like this is a just a nice to have aspect, which is RRS needs to swap, which is essentially two sets of operations, two set of move operations, while Aqua only needs to move because the destination is already empty. So it is just one move operation. So the time taken for each migration itself is just half. Cumulatively, those factors result in about an order of magnitude less mitigation, uh, less migrations performed or the amount of time performing migrations is also about 10x lower and the performance overhead is, uh, is correlated to the migration and for a range of um, spec workloads the normalized performance is close to the unpredicted baseline within about two percent with about two percent performance overhead compared to about 20 percent in in our address so how do you do this now? you first read out the overall and then exactly. you run Exactly. So maybe why not refreshing the neighbor rows to procure more, let's say, snowman? Because you have the first way for TRCD, then you have to, let's say, read a lot of 100 cache lines. Uh, yes. And then you have to write it. Yes. So, so your uh, so alternative? Works? You know, like, can I do uh, refresh on neighbor rows? Yeah, so that, that's refreshing the roles. Yeah, yeah, that that's, so, goes back to our point of victim refresh. You can, but there are some issues with it, as we saw, right? Half double. So we are trying to figure out mitigations that do not do not rely on victim refresh, right? But is it sorry, but 
Now I have a different question if you want to continue with this. Yeah, so to mitigate half double, you just need to refresh more rows when you need to take a mitigation action, mitigative action, right? So instead of, let's say we come up with a very robust refresh based mechanism and we refresh like eight rows uh, nearby the aggressor on each side, for example. Right. Then it solves the half double uh, attack. So that, yes, that, that's true. So let's think about what is the overhead of refreshing eight rows on both sides, right? Or eight rows overall. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's say we refresh eight rows. It's about 50 nanoseconds to refresh a row or activate a row. So about 500 nanoseconds, give or take, right? 10 rows, let's say 500 nanoseconds. What is the overhead of migrating a row? It is about 1.3 microseconds. So if you're refreshing that many rows, you, you might as well just migrate, right? It's good. But even in migration, the plasticity is some sort of a problem, right? So you migrate a single row, but it has the additive effect of, you know, those activations in other neighbor rows, not just the immediate. Not necessarily rows. because this is aggressor focus. So you don't care about the victims. You just take the aggressor out of the neighborhood of the victims uh, completely, right? Yeah, but how do you how do you track the effect of you know multiple different aggressor rows in a region? I, I would say in that the case, region? there was this very nice. Uh, I, I I see your question now. Uh, there are ways to essentially calculate the effective threshold if you have this blast radius effect, mm -hmm. which is more than one row. Stefan said I had a nice blog about it and how to compute that. So you can use that sort of sort of a thing. But I agree, you need like a notion of incorporating that within your one parameter that we care about, which is the threshold. Yes. Right. Okay. Moving so, on right along. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I have another one uh, related to this uh, migration overhead. So uh, this is not a fair question for Aqua. I know that because uh, these papers that I'm going to mention are published after Aqua. I think. The, the, uh, I think in particular, I'm going to ask about Shadow. Uh, right. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. So mm -hmm. it's from Namsu Kims and Jim Brown's group, I think. Uh, so uh, they're doing uh, migration. Uh, without going off chip so they they that, migrate rows within the DRM that is just faster i agree and um so did, did you consider that while uh, so design that there was a reason we were looking at uh non in dram solutions which was typically which side do you approach the problem from? if you approach it from the memory vendor side absolutely that is the solution row clone is another solution that would make this uh transfer of or migration of rows way faster but if you look at it from the CPU vendor side, they don't have access to these in DRAM solutions. And the reason CPU vendors might want to do Rohammer de or deploy Rohammer defenses is because DRAM vendors tried it once, did not succeed. So you might want to have some redundancy. So if you want to have in, in memory controller solutions, these would be the kind of solution to do. But absolutely, they are also another line of work which would work out. Yes. All right, so I'll <laughs> go ahead. I'll, I'll have to rush it. This is about the, um, the sizing of the current image. Yeah. You mentioned it doesn't increase with reducing thresholds, right? Yes. And then I was thinking, yes, how exactly? Are because, oh, you have this one. I, I, I okay. hit it, but I just clicked. Sorry, uh, let me ask. Basically, if the threshold is 10, um, you have to keep moving that row forever. So, so the interesting thing is, if the threshold is 10, you are incurring a lot of overhead just by the migration itself because the migration takes a microsecond. 10 activations take also about of the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. So at that point, your defense mechanism itself is impeding the rate at which you can you can hammer rows. And this analysis takes that into account. So the maximum rows that you can hammer is not just dependent on the threshold, but is also inversely dependent on the time that you take to move. And because you are moving a rows a lot, you don't have much time to uh, to actually hammer them. So that was the key insight. This holds for scalable row, so the row swap mechanism also. Uh, this would hold for, yes, scalable row swap, RRS, Aqua, any row mechanism. But then this also means that the bandwidth, like, well, kind of artificially, the memory bandwidth can be, you know, overhead much be, can be much more than 2x, right? Um, because if your time to move is like 10x the time to refresh or move uh, or activate a row. So it depends on the threshold. If your threshold is 10, Yes, mm -hmm. but if your threshold is ultra low, but mm -hmm. let's say more than 10, right? Like 32 or 64, then the then the overhead would be much less because 
32 activations would be again microsecond granularity and the move operation itself is microsecond. Mm -hmm. So yes, it depends on the threshold. Good. Yeah. My point again is like, why don't you uh, why does LNIK work as an exploiter? But basically, if you know that there is an intention of keeping activating the same row all the time, uh, we must assume that if this workload has good intention, it's only working with this small part of Why data. not cache it? I don't do cache it. Yeah, yeah. So that was no. done in the most recent solution, scalable row swap, just cache some rows. Um, and yeah, I agree. It would it would help. Um, unfortunately, you will have to pin the rows because it is already cached, right? In the in the in in the baseline. It is just that they are evicted even in when and workloads due to whatever their access pattern is. So you need to pin them, which is essentially just an SRAM overhead, right? Let's say I want to cache 10 rows. I, I now have an SRAM overhead of 80 kilobytes just because I have to pin them, right? Because I mean, when I look at the maintenance, even though they provide security, they still do a lot of things that damage a lot of like how the memory system works. For instance, sweeping rows, it means like if you have row bit, as you sweep them, you just keep showing your local locality a lot. Um, locality is at an intra row granularity. So row, row buffer locality is within a row, row. So that is not affected in these solutions. What even if you keep a row, you need to activate them. Oh yeah, yeah. The, you, you, you do need to do activations, but once you have migrated and let's say the threshold is a few hundreds, for the next few hundred activations, you can just do activations without doing any migration. Yeah. And mm -hmm. activation itself means, by the way, that you don't have locality. That means you just have to open a new row, right? That is assuming the most, let's say, not in the worst case scenario. Because I'm not talking about this. Think about the example of randomizing it all the time. It gets worse in your worst case scenario. That, I agree. Like the worst case is, as we discussed, right? Definitely more than 2% overhead, for sure. Right? So, I think we discussed this performance overhead is low. SRAM. So a quick word on SRAM overhead. Um, you again need an indirection table because you are essentially migrating, right? Um, at the memory controller level. Turns out um, you can actually virtualize this indirection table itself to DRAM and cache it. So that reduces the SRAM overhead to a few kilobytes per rank, few tens of kilobytes per rank, 32 kilobytes per rank at a threshold of 1000. And with a very negligible increase in threshold, uh, sorry, in the slowdown, right? All right. So let's quickly move along. And I'm running a little bit out of time. So what is the protocol here? I think we can stay as long okay. as you go. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll talk for ten or fifteen more minutes. I'll try to wrap it up quickly. If there are no questions. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm I'm happy to take them, and I'm happy to cover each slide. Right? This is a good brainstorm of uh, opportunities for us as well. So, uh, okay, let's keep going. Yeah. Quick question. Um, if you enable it in terms of confidentiality, if you enable it in memory encryption, which is, yeah. would, it, would it solve the problem or like, just not available? To the dip, dip, depends on what you mean by solving it, right? Like, yes, you will they decrypt use... garbage data, so you will not probably leak, so confidentiality is preserved. It yeah. will still not preserve data integrity. Yeah, but we could always refresh it or do it in care, or if system crashes, then we change a zero. What, what's your so solution? The question again? is like, I mean, if we run memory encryption, yes, if the integrity is broken, we detect this, and it is a way for us to catch that. So, how do you de detect integrity violations with memory encryption? Because if the memory integrity is broken, it will just not be encrypted and right? cannot read. So you, if the memory pages are broken, then... Uh, then de depends on how you encrypt, right? Like assuming, let's say, a cache line level encryption, you can decrypt, it will just produce a meaningless value. Uh, memory pages. I see. So memory you mean the header broken. is broken or... So when you want to decrypt memory pages, why would it not work? Like if, if they have some bit flips in, in there? If they we wouldn't be able to... Like, imagine like you have a encrypted uh, data yeah. and they change some of the, the yes. so it wouldn't work in. I mean, you will still be able to decrypt it as far as I understand. You will just have you garbage. Have, like, integrity, so what, what, so good, 
Good point. What are the integrity checks that you will perform on encrypted data? SGX like integrity? Yeah, SGX, SCB, CCI. So I'm just going to discuss that. Uh, um, and they have a lot of overheads. That's again the problem. SGX, oh. SGX has performance overheads. You don't do S, you typically don't do SGX at a memory level, right? You do it at a uh, at a smaller scale compared to the whole DRAM. So oh, you, you can do SGX version to all DRAM. You you absolutely can. Uh, it'll just have some overheads which I'll brief, uh, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. So stay tuned. Okay. So looking at Rohammer, turns out we might have a lot of attack vectors. We have a lot of characteristics to take care of. So okay, instead of designing a guaranteed defense that tries to eliminate the threat of Rohammer, what if we do some strong detection? I don't care how you flip bits, but if you flip bits, I'll be able to detect it. What if that is my threat model? Let's discuss that quickly. So again, all these defenses that we have covered so far um, rely on some key assumptions, right? Which is the threshold, the blast radius, and so on. And if these if these characteristics change for the worse, then your uh, then your defense might break down. The, the the threat model is no longer amenable to the defense, and uh, you might get it, right? So. In even in presence of these defenses, you can have systems that are vulnerable. There was this very nice work at ISCA this year called Rowpress, which is not exactly Rohammer. It is a different kind of fault mode, uh, uh, a different read disturbance error. But essentially, it says that you can have bit flips even if you have um, basically perfect protection against Rohammer because you don't have to activate the row as much. So I'm not going to talk about that because I haven't read the paper properly yet. but um, you have new fault modes coming up in these devices. So you need to be able to say that I can at least detect that if there is a bit flip, right? Even if I can't correct it. So um, I will very quickly cover this because we are running a little bit short on time. And I want to cover my next paper also. So if you have ECC, the key insight here is ECC gives you 12.5% uh, extra memory capacity. You get 64 bits of ECC for 512 bits of memory. So currently ECC is designed such that in every eight byte word, you can correct uh, one bit and detect two bits of errors. And chip kill is essentially a symbol based ECC. Instead of, bit, instead of words, you can, you can correct faults in entire chips or, and detect faults in the entire chip, right? So ECC conventionally focuses on correction with detection as a byproduct. You have to detect to be able to correct. And the, the thing is, what if I make detection my first order citizen and then try to correct as much as I can, right? I'm not sure why this slide is moving without my clicking. So sorry about that. But um, in your conventional segdet, you get eight bytes of data and eight bits of ECC, which can correct one error, detect two errors. But what if I have integrity protected memory, which was discussed at Safeguard at HPCA last year. Essentially, I redesigned the rethink the ECC. Instead of 64, you know, eight bytes of data and eight bits of ECC, I get 64 bytes of data and 64 bits of ECC. So the granularity is higher. With this 64 bits, I use 10 bits for one bit error correction and two bit error detection. So, um, but over a 64 byte word, so it cannot really correct, let's say, eight errors in eight eight byte words, eight single bit errors in eight byte words. It can correct one error in one 64 byte board. So the amount of error correction is reduced, but you get a very strong detection capability. You get a 54 bit map, which will essentially detect any tampering or any bit flips in your rows or in your boards or in your cache lines, essentially. So you get strong tampering detection with one ECC one, which is essentially one bit correction using conventional ECC demos, right? Using safeguard. If you look at the performance implications, we just discussed why SGX might not be amenable for full system protection. Even taking the integrity, integrity tree and the encryption overheads out of the equation, just the metadata access overheads for SGX will require uh, a perform, will, will have a performance impact of about 20%. Comparatively, there are other solutions which rethink ECC for reliability and security. Synergy is one such solution. Even that will have about 8% overhead because the map is stored in a different location. So you need to do these metadata accesses. Even if you have a cache, if you miss in the cache, you will have access over it. Safeguard does not have that because you are implicitly fetching the Mac in the ECC bits while you get your regular data. 
So negligible overheads, the overheads is just to compute the Mac. And the storage overhead is essentially none because the Mac is with the ECC module. Obviously, it does store the Mac. It's just that ECC is provided by default in ECC tests, right? And comparatively, SGX or Synergy will require 12.5% capacity loss, right? So let's quickly move on. And this question. So yes. are we comparing deterministic solutions to probabilistic solutions? No, they are both deterministic, right? No, but SGX solution is deterministic. You give 20%, let's say, none of the mass, but it's a deterministic solution. Um, so a safeguard, right? It has, so a safeguard. It can detect arbitrary. Oh, I, you, you mean 54, okay. Um, well, SGX is also not, okay, I see what you're saying. I, I see, okay. So, but I'm saying that 20% is, I think, overrated because I work on SGX for eight years now. Hmm? And if it is optimized, it can get like 3%. Um, so, but depends, like, uh, it's a claim. So, don't say something. okay. So, Coming back to the deterministic versus probabilistic, right? SGX is also probabilistic because the integrity check at the end is also based on a Mac. So Mac is, if you say Mac is probabilistic, then Mac is probabilistic. I wouldn't say that because it's, I would say it's cryptographic integrity protection, right? Because yes, there is a chance of escape, but that chance is two to the power minus 54 for a 54 bit Mac and SGX probably uses a 64 bit Mac. So very low, but it is, you, you, you can escape, but I wouldn't say that that's a reasonable assumption that it will escape even for SGX, right? Both for SGX and for, so, so question is, is it probabilistic? I wouldn't say that. The reason is, let's say you flip a bit in safeguard. You have a 54 bit Mac. You will be able to detect the bit flip, right? So coming to non ECC modules and I'll try to cover it in five or 10 minutes, right? Sorry about the delay. Um, if you don't have ECC and you still want to do uh, strong detection, what can you do? Well, let's let's try to limit our scope a little bit, try to be more specific about what we want to protect. And for that, let's look at the most severe vector of Rohammer attacks, which is the privilege escalation. So a user level process gains kernel privileges can compromise the whole system integrity. Typically the way that is done is, um, you have memory, your attacker requests a lot of virtual memory. So your physical memory is filled with page table pages. So pages just for the translation, right? These page table pages belong to the kernel. So they are not accessible by the user, but the system is full of them. Then the attacker performs Rohammer on its own page table pages by placing them strategically doing some memory massaging and induces a bit flip. Now, now the P, let's say the PFN bit, the page frame number of the page table page has flipped, right? So this page, this PTE now points to a random location. Because the attacker has sprayed the memory with virtual, um, with its own page table pages, there is a good chance that this memory, that this PTE now points to a page table page, which belongs to the attacker's virtual address space. Well, not to the attacker's virtual address space, but houses translation for the attacker's virtual, virtual address space. In this way, the attacker now has read and write access to its own page tables, right? And you can see where this goes, because now I can just change the PFN value of my own page table, access any data legitimately, right? And I gain kernel privileges because you now have access to your physical memory. So this breaks system security, and this is the most severe Ruhammer exploit, which has been shown time and again in many, many attacks. There are defenses that specifically protect against page tables in the presence of Ruhammer. One such defense is the monotonic pointers, which was uh, discussed at Asplos 2019. Essentially, what it says is Ruhammer, they, they found, or Ruhammer is known to have unidirectional bit flips. So let's say a one will flip to a zero, but a zero will not flip to a one for whatever internal reasons, uh, electrical reasons, right? Or if they have anti DRAM, I don't know if they are called anti DRAM cells, but if they have a certain different kind of cells, a, a zero will flip to a one, but not the other way around. So what if you place your page tables in memory such that even if you incur bit flips, they will move, they will point to another user space page, but not a different page table page. So you have a watermark in memory. All your page table pages are above that watermark. And because a one can only flip to a zero, any bit flip in your page table pages 
will point to a location which is below that watermark. And since it is below that watermark, you can never point to a page table page, never make page table self-referential and not gain kernel privileges. This is still an attack. It is just not a privilege escalation attack. But the problem here is TFN is only one part of the PTE. PTE consists of many more metadata bits, tens of metadata bits, such as your protection keys, memory protection keys, your user supervisor bit, which determines if this page is to be run in kernel space or user space and so on and so forth. So what if I happen to flip a bit, which was in the, which was the no execute bit? Well, there are some permission checks in your, in your current uh, processors, which are called write XOR no execute, write XOR execute permissions. Essentially, you can have a write enabled page, but you cannot execute that page. You can have a executable page, but you cannot write to that page. This is to protect against um, return oriented programming, buffer overflow type, memory safety type attacks. Right. And if you flip this no execute bit, now you're, even though you have access to your page, write access to your page, this, this um, check by the processor will pass and you will be able to execute and write to the same page, which can enable some advanced attacks. Now, this can happen in any field. So PT is not the, PFN is not the only field that you need to protect. You, if you really want some strong integrity, some strong protection for your page tables, you should protect all the fields, including the metadata and your page frame numbers. Now, we just looked at Mac-based solutions and, Mac, and we found that Mac does provide strong integrity protection. So what if I compute a Mac over all of the page PTE entries? So each entry is eight bytes. You have eight entries in a 64 byte cache line. You compute the Mac, place them in DRAM. And then whenever you read that back, you get the Mac again, and then you compare to find if the Mac verification passes. The problem there is, as we have discussed, you have to store the Mac somewhere, which for page tables might not be a big overhead, but you also have to access the Mac. And this is in the critical path. This metadata access can cause a lot of performance slowdown. This is akin to what we have in SGX and other, uh, other sim similar integrity protection mechanisms, right? The access overhead is always a problem. So Mac provides integrity protection as we have seen, but it has high access and storage overheads. So what can we do about it? Well, the key insight in, in PT guard is your PFN is quite large. Your PFN is 40 bits wide. So PT is a provision to accommodate up to four petabytes or address up to four petabytes of physical memory. But we have laptops, we have desktop, we have our client devices. None of them even have close to that amount of memory. Typically, your desktops and laptops will not have more than a terabyte of memory. So you will only use 28 bits of your 40-bit PFN. And these 12 bits can actually be repurposed to store a Mac. Now, 12-bit Mac is not very secure because you have a high chance of escaping detection. But what if you use all of the bits in your empty bits in your PTs within a cache line, you pool these bits together, so you now have 12 times 8, 96 bits and embed a very strong 96 bit Mac in that. Any, any tampering in that PTE will now be detected on reads. And, and what's, what's more, you will get this Mac along with your access implicitly. So you don't need to do any metadata access overheads. You don't have any storage overhead because it's implicit. You don't really use anything. So it obviates the storage and access overheads. How does it work? I'll quickly run through this. In your cores and caches, you have your PTEs, but you do not embed the Mac there, right? So you don't want to change your OS. You don't want to change your core. You don't want to change your, your caches. When it comes to the memory controller, PT guard is implemented there. Your cache line gets evicted from the caches. You embed the Mac there, and then you put it in the, put it in the DRAM. Whenever you want it back, you, you read it, you check the Mac integrity. If there is a violation, it will flag it. It will not, uh, it will not forward the data if there is an integrity violation. And if, if there is no violation, then it will remove the Mac. So the organization of the page table cache line, PTE cache line remains exactly the same as baseline to the cores and the caches and the OS. So you can now detect arbitrary bit flips and this detection spans all PTE fields. So not only page frame numbers. Now, go ahead. How do you know if a cache line is a PTE That's a good question. And we will just cover that. How do you know 
a line is a PT cache line, right? So turns out because we are able to embed this Mac, since we are able to em em embed this Mac, the bits that correspond to these embedded Mac bits have to be zero. Otherwise they will contain some data and they are indeed zeroed out by the, by the OS. So one way to detect a line is a PT cache line is that you, on DRAM writes, you just do a bit pattern match and see if the, if these 96 bits are zeroed out. And if they are, you, em you compute the Mac and em embed the Mac in those 96 bits and then store them in memory. And when you get it back, um, when you, when you need to read it back, you read it back. I I'll showcase what you do when you read it back, right? Chance of escape, very, very low, vanishingly low. For if you do continuous DRAM writes, just to like illustrate how low this probability is, you will take a trillion years of writing faulty or reading faulty page table entries every essentially every nanosecond to be able to get an escape event, right? It's just not happening. There is a chance that the 96 bits where you embed the Mac happen to match the computed Mac over the other bits. So on reads, you will now erroneously remove those, those Mac bits as uh, thinking that that is the Mac. But this is a collision event that does not occur in, in regular programs because the probability is again the probability of escape. But if it does occur, you need to have some correctness guarantees. So you just place the line address in a collision tracking buffer. Essentially, whenever that, that line is written back, you do not embed the Mac because you know the data in that line corresponds to the Mac bits. And when, when it is read back, you do not remove the Mac because there is no Mac in those lines. That just happens to be the data that matches the Mac value computed over the line. So with only a few tens of bytes of SRAM, you are now able to provide integrity protection for page tables against not just Rohammer, but practically all uh, fault-based attacks on your DRAM. I wouldn't say all because it does not protect against replay attacks, but almost all other attacks. Okay, so what happens in the presence of bit flips? If you have bit flips, the PT guard detects it, no data is forwarded to the caches and core, an exception is raised to the OS, the OS can deal with it. Because no data is, uh, is, is forwarded to the caches, even speculatively, you cannot read corrupted PT values. So even speculation-based attacks will not work here. For a data line, however, if there is a bit flip, so the Mac does not match, PT guard will just assume that this is uh, what the value is for the line and it will forward the data. So note that PT guard is not meant to protect or designed to protect data lines. It will forward corrupted data, which is no different than the baseline, which is already unprotected. So for data lines, if you have bit flips, tough luck, but for page table, Entries that you have bit flips, you will be able to detect it. What are the results? Um, over spec and gap workloads, we see that the performance overhead is about 1%, 1.3% on average, correlated with the LNC and PKI, last level cache misses, miss rate. The reason is if you miss more, if you miss more often, you will incur more Mac verification. You will you will read more lines back and you will incur more Mac, Mac verification delay on every read because you have to read every line to see if a Mac is embedded in that line or not. Can we do something about it? Well, this is what we have currently for PT guard, right? Turns out there are more bits in the PT cache line, which are zeroed out because they are reserved by the OS. So instead of incurring a delay on every read, what if you do a bit pattern match over this extended P, uh, extended bit, uh, bit pattern of like 96 plus 56 bits. This 56 bits are reserved by the OS and zeroed out but we use it to optimize PT guard. If you do this extended bit pattern match, you can embed an identifier, a, a randomly generated unique, uh, well, not unique, a randomly generated value, 56 bit value. So on reads, if you get this value, you do not have to delay. So there is no overhead. Similarly, we see that a lot of page table lines, page table entries are zero cache lines because you allocate a page, you allocate a page, but you do not, uh, sorry, but uh, you commit memory, but you do not allocate a physical page. So the cache line is completely zeroed out. So if that is the case, then you just check if the bits are zero and then uh, do some optimization. You don't think are any deal. These optimizations reduce the performance overhead to basically negligible, less than 0.3%. And the increase in SRAM is also negligible from, and still less than 100 bytes of SRAM, right? So PT guard also has detection capability. I will not cover that in the interest of time, but essentially in the presence of Mac, this nice diagram illustrates it. 
you don't have to do an exact match with the map because even if a few bits are off in the computed and uh, computed and embedded Mac, that essentially means the, means there is a bit flip in the Mac because otherwise, because if that was not the case, your data had bit flips, then the computed Mac would be completely different from your embedded Mac. So if the computed and embedding map, embedded Macs are very close to each other in terms of having distance or the number of bits that are different, then it's most likely just bit flips in Mac, right? Using this insight, you can design some correction capabilities. We designed that. Uh, I will not cover that in the interest of time. The key, key, key point is you can actually correct about 90% of bit flips uh, just by using this insight and some, some interesting ways to perform in informed guesses on really value. So, so uh, I have a question um, related yeah, to yeah. the reduction of the number of bits for the, for the PFN. Did you, how did you come up with the 28 number? Did you have any sensitivity analysis and like, what is the, okay. Yeah, the yeah. the 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 reasoning because as far as I understood, if you reduce that number, basically you're reducing the number of, of physical of 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 of, the, of frames that you can address, and I of course it's it, the number of frames that application is going to address is going to depend on the the memory footprint of that particular application. Right. Uh, yeah. But yeah. did. Did right. you have a reasoning why uh, 28 is enough and for what type of workloads? And if not, what would happen? What happened yeah. if I yeah. do 29, for example? So, so yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, hello. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hello. Jalo, Jalo. Jalo. Please. Okay. I think he moved. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, there was some echo. Sorry about that. So we are designing protection for non-ECC memories. So they are, we are focusing on client systems. 28 bits of PFN corresponds to a terabyte of addressable memory. Your phones, and by memory, I don't mean storage, right? I mean RAM. Your phones, laptops, desktops, anything which does not have ECC typically has few gigabytes or few tens of gigabytes of memory. One terabyte is really an upper limit which we have not reached with phones or laptops, right? Like I think the latest MacBook Pro has about 128 GB or 64 GB of addressable memory. So 120, one terabyte is a lot. And question is, if you have more than one terabyte, you can store a smaller Mac, right? This, is, this gives you a 96 bit Mac. If you have, let's say 16 terabytes, you will still have space for a 64 bit Mac, which is pretty secure, right? So that, that, that's basically the answer. We're considering non-ECC memories. Typically, if you have multi-terabyte memories, you will have ECC and then you can do safeguard. If you don't have ECC and you still have multi-terabyte memories for some reason, you can just reduce the size of the Mac. It will still be secure. 64-bit Mac is still very secure. Right? Question. Yes. Is maintenance only protects for this uh, patient? Yes. yes. All right. So, can, can I add that? Can you back my last question, actually? Yes, go ahead. So uh, when I look at the uh, key idea here, um, yes, I I I don't see a like a fundamental limitation of this idea to make it focused on page table entries in particular. Ah. So uh, mm -hmm. just one second. So uh, going back to Atabar's question about uh, uh, understanding if a cache entry is PT entry or not. Uh, as well, so uh, instead of like detecting that, uh, as you described, and instead of limiting the whole idea to page tables, can we just ask the user or the system to mark some part of data as like security critical or something like that, just like add one bit on top of what you have, and then extend this to like uh, any kind of data basically. So, so two points, right? One is. For page tables, yes, you can. You can just mark it by, the OS can just mark page tables using a different instruction or using a different bit. Problem is you are not changing the OS just to protect page tables. So why not protect every, every like all critical data as you want? But the problem there would again be metadata access overheads. The reason we have low overheads with PT guard is because you don't perform Mac, ac Mac accesses into DRAM because they're implicitly embedded. For arbitrary data, you probably cannot embed the Mac inside the inside the cache line. So you will essentially have a design closer to 
typical integrity protection like safeguard or not safeguard sorry synergy or sgx so okay. that is the main but your question being why don't i protect data with mac i'm all up for it we just need to reduce the overheads so, so, i think what you are meant was like if you you know have a similar encoding in the data that you want you organize your data in a way that oh, yeah. it looks like a page table entry right? yeah, yeah and then oh so interesting yeah you can do no, not exactly what that's a good idea. <laughs> but but that's one idea, right? Like your compiler essentially it's basically data layout, right? Like if, if I have a compiler which does that, I can protect it. Like I just need basically eight bits for every eight bytes to be offset. So yeah. that that's some it might not work because the processor you will need to perform some sort of rearrangement when you bring the data into the cache because now your date your 64 byte line only contains 56 bytes of data so you need to do two two accesses to do 64 byte of conventional data access if, if the program is aware of the layout doesn't it? if doesn't the program is aware absolutely typically <clears throat> for these mechanisms or for security in general you want it to be transparent so mm -hmm. you don't have to reprogram but if the programmer is up for it for sure you can do that okay i will have three more slides and thank you so much for bearing with me until for like until right now, it's been a while. So but let's look at it, right? We looked at sub 1000 thresholds, found that there are some solutions. Hydra comes to mind for tracking. What if you just scale the threshold to extremely low values? And, and the question might be, well, why do you want to do that? Remember in the last eight years, the threshold has reduced by 30 times. If you reduce the threshold by another 30 times, from you know three years ago when the last published results came in or two years ago then your threshold becomes 160 by around 2028 which is not that far from now if you want to design systems right now you will want to consider those thresholds so what they, what about sub 100 thresholds turns out even hydra so look at 512 right hydra has same performance as an ideal tracker ideal tracker is just per row counters in sram no tracking overhead just perform the simulation. So like, it's like an oracular tracker. Same overheads as let's say an ideal tracker, orders of magnitude less extra, 550 kilobytes versus four megabytes. Now let's go to 32, 64, 16, right? Your ideal tracker at 16, threshold of 16 has an overhead of 1.5 megabytes. Hydra has an overhead of 700 kilobytes for ISO capacity, right? So your SRAM advantage disappeared. So let's say you want to do you want to work with less SRAM. Hydra allows you to do that. Your SRAM overhead does not depend on your Rohama threshold. If you do ISO SRAM, if you only have 90 kilobytes of SRAM, which is I think the, the default for two threshold of 256, your performance overhead skyrocket. So either you have high SRAM overhead or high performance overheads at these extremely low thresholds. Given the possibility that they might occur in the next decade, what can you do about it? That's an open question. Second is, what about emerging memory technologies? So CXL is one such emerging technology or one such interconnect for, for memory. Typically, your processor is directly connected to your DRAM. But what if you have, um, what if you can now have load store semantics and access to, to memory, which is not connected over your DDR bus? So you have PCIe and through PCIe, you connect to an external memory controller and that connects to more DRAM devices. This is the, this is one of the use cases of CXL, which gives you cache coherent load store semantics for, for way larger memory compared to what you could typically get because it uses PCIe, which is a serial interface instead of DDR, which is a parallel interface. So now you have a plug and play model of memory. You, you provide, CXL provides you CPU, you know, load store accesses to pooled or external or external memory using uh, cache coherent type 3 device. That's CXL, nothing to do with Rohammer again. What are the implications of CXL on Rohammer, right? You have now heterogeneous memory systems. There have been talks by cloud vendors like Microsoft that instead of plugging my brand new DDR5 memory, via CXL, which is kind of a slower interface. It has lower latency, a higher latency and slow, lower bandwidth. What if I just reuse my DDR4 devices? I have a lot of them lying around. They are pretty good in terms of cost per bit. They are not too bad in terms of performance. 
I'll just attach that over CXL, use my brand new shiny DDR5 for, for direct attached memory. Now, the GDR4s we just saw for the last one and a half hours are vulnerable to Roham. What do you do about that, right? They are not changing that. Second is for very large, CXL has outlook for a very large scale memory system. So essentially, and this is different from remote memory, by the way, because there is no node managing that. This is just a bunch of switches and intelligent memory controllers that plug into various sockets. And now each socket has access to tens of terabytes or even more memory. The first thing is in terms of fault tolerance and reliability, your failure modes have increased because instead of relying on one generation of DRAM, you're relying on different generations of DRAM spread across different units, even racks, right? Your failure mode is way different compared to regular DRAM, re regular server systems. Secondly, you have DRAM, which is already manufactured and you want to protect that for the next five years as this one tier, as present in one tier memory. How do you manage Rohammer in with CXL? I would say that is another key aspect, which is interesting to look at. All right. So that has been that that will be it. Thank you so much for listening patiently for one and a half hours. And thanks. Thanks a lot for hosting me. Thank you so much. So maybe we can yes, another round of questions. Yes, absolutely. Yes, go ahead. Um, did you see any trust with trust zone? With what? Um, trust zone. That offers a private memory. Yes. I just don't know if there are any In terms of low hammer? It's like to protect the DRAM through the private memory. Right. Um, I think in principle, it is similar to SGX, if I remember correctly. Fine. So SGX would still work on multiple isolated memory regions within the DRAM. Yes. But farm trust zone is different than farm CCA. Farm trust zone is the older technology which offers complete private memory. That I see. That's the normal. So, normal. so my question then first would be when you say private memory, are you able to say that in the physical memory, my region is not co located with any other rows from yeah. any other process? I, would, I mean, say so. I'm not an expert on it, but, but because it depends on the manufacturer. Typ the manufacturer yeah. Manufacturer. Typically, what I've seen is if DRAM vendors have their proprietary DRAM, well, physical to line DRAM row mapping then your private memory is private as far as the memory controller and chip are concerned. But as far as the DRAM device is concerned, they may be co-located with rows from other processes, just not accessible. So the basic question is, could we design an external memory uh, region to implement any of your tracker mechanisms? Like, yeah. Like, of course, it's not a uh, legacy compatibility, but so if you have like a memory region which is independent of any other untrustworthy processes or domains you will be able to protect against privilege escalation confidentiality violations data corruption can still occur because you you might just incur bit flips on your own data because of your own access pattern so it will not eliminate rohammer it will reduce the vulnerability the, the attack space of Rohan. Yeah. Other questions? I don't have a question, but about CXL, I think you mentioned there is having yeah. a smaller bandwidth right, over the CXL channel. Yes. So the DDR4 itself probably has, at least the first generation has more bandwidth than CXL. I don't know, like a single. I wouldn't say that. So let's look at the numbers, right? DDR4, I think, has a per channel bandwidth of about 24 GB per second, 25 GB per second, right? PCIe 5, which is where CXL is supported, has a bi-directional bandwidth of 128 GB per second or 64 GB per second each direction. So you can actually have two DDR4 channels in each PCIe channel. So if you have an X16 PCIe channel, you can connect two DDR channels without any loss of bandwidth. It's not necessarily lower bandwidth. The way, okay, so I have a comment here. There are two ways to look at CXL. One is to look at it as pooled memory. So eight sockets connect to this pool of memory. Each socket only gives it an X8 lane. So it's really bandwidth constrained. You, you are able to access a terabyte of memory, which obviously is more than one channel, but you only have eight or 16 lanes. So you, you are bandwidth constrained in that way. Mm -hmm. The second way to look at it is actually, as I just mentioned, 16 lanes of PCIe have more bandwidth than 16 or one DDR4 channel. Then can you, can you actually win in terms of bandwidth with PCIe? That was a work that I did, which 
is under submission and also online on archive. It's, um, it's essentially called a case for CXL centric servers, where we look at this exact problem. What is the bandwidth implication of CXL? Turns out you can actually win on bandwidth with CXL. Yeah. So if I, I'll point you to that if you're interested. But latency is for sure higher. So latency okay. is for sure higher. Question is by how much and why? So why is the CXL latency higher? The reason is PCI. So why is the PCI latency higher? The reason is PCI is a serial interface. So you have to do some serialization, packetizing, and then deserialization at the other, other end of the wire. This incurs some latency overheads. What are the overheads? What, what is the range of this overheads? Industrial products have it, have it in the range of 100 to 200 nanosecond over your baseline memory access latency of let's say 100 to 100 nanoseconds. So 2x. We looked at other implementations which does not incur a lot of these overheads because a lot of these overheads come because in your memory controller, CXL memory controller, you have a knock, you have a network on chip because you want to connect eight sockets to 16 channels of memory, let's say. But if you don't want to do that, if you only want to connect one socket to one channel of memory, most of these overheads go away. They are as low as 30 nanoseconds, which is not that bad compared to a access latency of about 100 nanoseconds, right? So I, I, would, I would be happy to chat about that. Or okay, yeah. then uh, uh, I will add one more thing uh, and then we can finish. So uh, since I am a co-author in WordPress, I will shamelessly uh, add another uh, feature direction to your slide. Please do. Uh, so maybe we need to re revisit and re-engineer like um, draw swap based draw hammer mitigations and the like like aqua or uh, the integrity based uh, detection mechanisms like uh, PT guard, right? Uh, in, in the existence of WordPress as so, well. So I would say in terms of aqua row migration based defenses, absolutely. This is a new threat model which was not accounted for. For integrity protection, I would say as long as you can detect bit flips, you can protect integrity. So not quite, but yes, I mean in general for sure, row press is a very exciting new thing which I really am very interested in. So for most of the defenses, yes. For integrity protection, if you don't you, if you don't care about eliminating the threat, but you just care about detecting the hammer using Max, I think you can still do that. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Thanks a lot. It was a great talk. Thank you so much. Thanks for lunch. <laughs> Thank you for patiently listening. Yeah. <laughs> Always great to have.